uh, is John Mills uh, being ably interviewed by Liam. Thank you, Alex. It's very nice to be here. Congratulations to the Centre for Policy Studies for putting on this important lecture series. I mean, James Carville, Clinton's uh, chief political strategist, that's Bill Clinton, uh, the one who is, was president of the United States, because the other one never will be. Um, I think she needs to accept that and move on. Um, told us it's the economy, stupid. But so far during this election campaign, it's almost like there's a phony war. The, the election... Uh, hasn't, there's been lots of discussions of microeconomic policy, there's been lots of discussions of budgets, there's been no soaring overall analysis of economic growth. And of course, economic growth is the context in which everything else happens. It's what allows everything else to happen. It's the generation of wealth that generates the taxation that our politicians are spending so much time arguing about. Um, I am an economist, that means I don't know what I'm talking about and I'm going to make you feel as if that's your fault. Um, but John Mills is also an economist, and he's the complete opposite of me in that he has a long track record of speaking and writing extremely clearly about complex issues. I'm a long-standing admirer of John's work. John, it's fantastic to be here to uh, interview you uh, this evening. John is one of the nicest guys involved in British public life. Um, he is a very much his own man. He donates to the Labour Party over many years, yet he is a, a staunch Brexiteer, very much um, an, uh, an analytical advocate of reasons why we would be better off outside uh, the European Union. I've also admired for a long time John's writing. Uh, he's produced numerous books, uh, often about macroeconomics, always with a very, very clear focus on policy outcomes. He produces the kind of macroeconomics that ministers can read in the back of their car as they're being driven home, and they most often do. We are in an economic conundrum. The whole of the Western world is suffering from low productivity. Uh, it seems a long time since the days when we could assume 2 to 3% growth we can't now even rely on 1% growth. That's not a Brexit thing, that's right across the Western world. So I'm delighted, ladies and gentlemen, to say, and put your hands together, for the man who's got the answers, John Mills. Well, thank you very much, uh, Liam, and Alex, too, for the introduction. And thank you for the CPS for getting this organized. Uh, and particularly for Lord Benson, Nigel Benson, I don't think he's here this evening, who contributed financially to getting all this to, together. Um, it's a bit strange in a way for me up here on the CPS platform, I've been a, a long time Labour supporter, but I think the whole issue around uh, growth and whether we've got a new normal of 1% uh, is uh, something that's really a cross-party issue. Thank you very much. And, and one, therefore, I'm very pleased to uh, be here to talk about. Now, talking about the British economy is reminiscent of a meeting that took place in about 1990 between Sir John Major and Michael Gorbachev. <coughs> and Sir John Major went to, to Moscow to have this discussion. And he had this meeting with Gorbachev. And he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tell me, how is the Soviet economy doing? And Gorbachev said, good. And uh, John Major said, well, that's very helpful. Can you tell me a little bit more detail about how it's all going? And Gorbachev said, yes, not good. <laughs> and that's a bit really where we are. I mean, in some ways, the British economy is doing well. Unemployment is very low. Inflation is very low. Uh, the standard of living we've got is very high compared to lots of other places in the world. But we've also got really very major problems. And these are the ones I'd really like to talk to you. But before doing that, I'd just like to say something about how important I think economic growth is and how what's happened is that we've dropped back now to have a new normal of somewhere around about 1% or 1.5% at maximum. And this is enormously problematical, I think, for at least four reasons. One is that if you've got growth as low as that, particularly because of our growing population, you finish up with no increases in living standards for most of the population. 
And secondly, because of all that, you've got a huge amount of discontent. And you can see this in the election that's running at the moment, and you can see it in Brexit, you can see what's happened in Trump. These problems are ones that are found right across the West. It's not just the uh, UK that's got these problems, but we've got big political and social problems on the back of the uh, poor economic performance that we've achieved. If we grow at 1% and the rest of the world grows at 3.5% and China at 5 or 6% per annum, this is going to produce a massive change over a relatively short period of time in the status of countries and their influence in the world, and that's a really major problem. And also, I think we've got some very expensive problems coming down the track. If, if we've got no resources to deal with them, we're going to be in serious trouble. We've got health costs, which are clearly rising all the time. We've got climate change. We've got to redress the fact that we cut back on education expenditure by about 1% over the last... 1% uh, of GDP of the last decade, and we've got a huge problem with an aging population and social care. So there are very, very compelling reasons, really, for doing something better about getting the economy to grow. And when you look around at what people say ought to be done, it's a rather sorry picture. I mean, by and large, on the left, you've got uh, people who advocate industrial strategies, they want less short-termism, they want more infrastructure expenditure, they want more money spent on education and training. On the right, you've got a rather different complex of lower taxation, a smaller state, more privatization, all this sort of thing. But neither of these agendas really work on their own. And I think that really what's gone wrong as much as anything else is not so much on the supply side, which these, issue, these uh, policies address, it's on the demand side where things have really gone, gone wrong. And what we really need is some fresh thinking about all this. And what I'd like to do is to put to you a, 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 a evidence-based case for saying <clears throat> that actually the problems in terms of getting the British economy to grow, but 3 or 4% per annum, are not impossible to solve. And I'd like to suggest to you how I think it should be done. Now, basically, the problem is, I think, that the British economy has got more and more unbalanced over the last few years. And it's unbalanced in the six interrelated ways, and I'll tell you uh, what they are. <clears throat> the first is that we invest far too little of our GDP every year. We invest around about 17% of our GDP. The world average is 25%, and in China it's about 45%. But worse than this, not only have we got very low levels of investment generally, but in the really crucial parts of the economy where growth is to be found most readily, our record is far, far worse. And the, if you look at the, uh, the uh, brochures that have been handed round, if you have a look at the second table, you get some idea about how poor our performance is in terms of investment compared to the rest of the world. And I think the reason for this is that the economic growth doesn't come from all sorts of investment. Most forms of public sector investment do very little to contribute to economic growth. Roads, schools, hospitals, uh, housing. And the same is true actually in quite a lot of private sector investment as well, in, in uh, office blocks, in shopping malls, in new restaurants, in IT projects. Again, you've got very little contribution towards economic growth. Where it com really comes from is in three overlapping areas. One is mechanization, second is technology, and the third is power. And it's really, if you look at the way the economies of the world have developed since the late 18th century, it's really these are three er areas that have been the drivers of, uh, of economic growth. And our expenditure in these areas is pitifully low. It's about 3% of GDP. And if you look at depreciation of existing assets in those areas, it's slightly more than 3% of GDP. So the net effect of all this is that we are spending no money on investment in the areas which actually produce economic growth. And that's the main reason why we've got such a huge productivity problem. Now, why have we got in this situation? I think the reason is that most of these sorts of investment that really produce high rates of economic growth find their natural home in 
the light industrial sector and in the internationally traded sector. And if you look at the graph, that's the first item on the plate you've got, you see what the problem has been. The problem really started in the 1970s and 80s with high levels of inflation. And understandably, getting inflation down moved to being the central economic target. And this was done very largely by putting interest rates up to astronomical levels, nearly 20%, and constricting the money supply. But the effect of all this was to drive the exchange rate up between 1977 and about 1977 and 1982 by something like 60%. And then taken over from this was a new trend that developed, which was a huge degree of liberalization of the British economy as we took, started selling off assets right, left, and center, our football clubs, loads of businesses, masses of property, and the enormous influx of money that came in as a result on the back of this, something like a trillion pounds in the 21st century, has driven up the exchange rate even further to something like twice what it was in 1977. Now, I spent 25 years running businesses in manufacturing, and I'll tell you that if the exchange rate goes up by 60%, and two-thirds of your costs are in sterling, what you're faced with is an increase in what you're trying to recover from the rest of the world of two-thirds of 60%, which is 40%. And because an international trading, particularly in manufacturers, is very, very price sensitive, you finish up with a huge problem of lack of profitability and declining sales. And this leads on to the third problem that we've got, which is that we've deindustrialized to a massive extent over the last 40 years. In, even as late as 1970, about uh, just under a third of our GDP came from manufacturing. It's now well under 10% and still falling. And this has given us four massive problems which all contribute to the difficulties we've got. Uh, the first is that Manufacturing, as I said earlier on, is the main generator of productivity increases. And if the manufacturing component of your GDP goes down, you run into bigger and bigger productivity gain problems, which clearly we've got. Secondly, the economy has become more and more lopsided because London has powered ahead based on services, whereas the rest of the country, which is much more dependent on manufacturing, has, uh, has gone into just declined. And the gap between London and the southeast and the rest of the country has got wider and wider. With the decline of manufacturing, have gone millions of good jobs. And then leading on to the next problem, which we've got, because we haven't got nearly enough to sell to the rest of the world, and most of our foreign trade earnings, or just under half of them, come from manufacturing still, we've run a huge balance of payments deficit. Now, we run a balance of payments deficit of somewhere around about 5% of GDP which means that year after year, we're enjoying a standard of living about 5% higher than we're actually earning. And about 40% of that comes from a trade imbalance. Uh, we do well on services, but dismally badly on uh, manufacturers. But the rest of it comes partly because we've sold off so many assets that the net income that we get from abroad, which used to be quite substantial, has shifted the other way. And we've now got a net deficit on that front. We've also got substantial transfer payments to the EU on, on our uh, aid programs and on remittances. And the total comes to somewhere around about 100 billion pounds a year. Now, if you've got a balance of payments deficit of that size, uh, because of the, all borrowing and all lending has to match up, you're bound to have a large government borrowing deficit and or, or, or it's got to be financed some other way by consumer borrowing, and we've got both. We've got large amounts of borrowing by the government and very, very substantial consumer debt. So we've got a problem on that front, and then it washes over yet again into the inequality problems we've got, where there are three dimensions, really. One is the inequality between London and the southeast and the rest of the country. You've got intergenerational inequalities. And you've also got socio-economic ones. Actually, income distribution over the last decade hasn't become more unequal than it was before, but wealth distribution certainly has. So there's a big agenda there to be tackled. Now, what do we do about it? Well, I think the answer is that we've got to do something 
which actually no other country has ever done before, which is that we've got to reindustrialize. We've got to bring the percentage of GDP coming from manufacturing up from under 10 percent, probably to somewhere around about 15 percent to get some sort of reasonable balance back again. And the key is to getting investment up, but we'll never get investment up unless it's profitable, and this takes us back to the exchange rate problem. And essentially what we need to do is we need to get the uh, exchange rate to a point where it's worthwhile citing new industrial plant in the UK rather than China or Germany or Holland or somewhere else. And unless we can do that, we'll never get the investment to, to the, on the scale we need. It's all very well having capital allowances and this sort of thing. They all help, but they're not sufficient on their own to make the sort of scale of investment we require uh, to be able to get the economy to grow up. And essentially, if you want to get the economy to grow at 3.5% per annum instead of 1.5% per annum, what you need to do is you need to shift about 4% of GDP into the sort of investment that will produce a 50% annual return. And if you don't believe 50% annual return is possible, have a look at the papers in front of you. I think it's the third one down, shows, or maybe I think it's the second one down, shows the returns that other countries manage to get on the investment that they make compared to ours. And you see that the countries that have been really successful have grown really fast, like Japan after the war and China more recently, have got much higher levels of GDP, as, uh, investment as a, as a percentage of GDP, but also much, much higher uh, returns on the investment they have made. And that's because of the pattern of investment, uh, particularly in, in, in manufacturing. But it does show that it is possible to get as much as a 50% return on the sort of investment that's most productive. If you say you've got 4% moved to, to investment that produces a 50% return, you finish up with a 2% more growth than you've got at the moment. And that is essentially the key to getting it done. Now, why don't we do this? Well, it's partly because we have a very different view about what to do with sterling. In lots of other countries in the world, the one thing they really want to do is to keep the sterling competitive to make sure that their export industries all work well. If you go to South Korea, you go to China, Japan for a long period of time, Germany for decades, Swiss now, that's what they do. Whereas our attitude has always been to feel that the, you need to have the pound as strong as possible. But the trouble is that the stronger the pound is, the cheaper your holidays abroad, the cheaper your imports are, the more the, your manufacturing industry collapses and the worse your long-term prospects become. But there are also some practical reasons why people are against uh, devaluation, and these are worth running over, because most of the arguments against them actually really aren't very strong. One argument is that it can't be done, but other countries manage to do it perfectly well, and the reason why they do it is because they have some sort of control on capital imports, you can't just go around and buy any old company. They have restrictions on what you can purchase in the way of property and so forth. And I'm not suggesting that what we do is to become a sort of island state cut off from the rest of the world. But all these other countries that have managed to run their economies with competitive exchange rates have done so, broadly speaking, within the relatively free world we have at the moment. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that if that's what the government aimed to do which is not what it's aiming to do at the moment, which I'm arguing it should do. The second is whether we have retaliation. Now, we are under quite a lot of obligations internationally not to run uh, some predatory exchange rate policies, and I'm not suggesting we should, uh, but it's not uh, clearly sustainable for us to go on running with a balance of payments deficit of 5% of, of, of GDP every year and there's no evidence from previous devaluations that actually there will be retaliation because people will realize that the situation is intolerable and there's not much been an alternative but to go for it. And this didn't happen, but for example, between 2007 and 2009, when the exchange rate against the dollar went down by 25%, no retaliation then, none when we came out of the ERM in 1992, with a trade-weighted uh, de depreciation of about 
a very little reason for believing it didn't happen again in future. There's an argument that it makes us all poorer to devalue, and of course if you measure it all in dollars, of course it will do, but people don't shop in dollars, they shop in pounds. And it can't be true that if GDP gets larger as a result of a more competitive economy, and the average GDP per head goes up, that everybody's worse off, though there is a problem, which I'll come back to in just a moment, which is if you're going to rebalance the economy and not have a big balance of payments deficit, but then what you do have to do is you have to shift resources out of consumption and into investment, and there is a problem there, which actually is quite an acute one for any economy that wants to grow faster than it is or has been just doing very recently. There's an argument that we've tried devaluation before, it doesn't work. That's again a fallacy. If you look at the figures that, uh, in that graph that you uh, got in front of you there, you see that there have been dips and ups and downs on, on, on the exchange rate. Uh, but generally speaking, the trend has been upwards to make the economy more and more uncompetitive. And we've, when we have devalued, we've done it too little and too late. And some people advance the argument that the UK is no good at manufacturing and therefore that uh, we ought to leave it to the Chinese and the Germans and the Dutch to do it. But that really is an argument of despair. And bear in mind that it was the UK that pioneered the Industrial Revolution in the first place. To say that if, if it was possible to make money out of manufacturing, people wouldn't be found in this country to be able to do it, it seems to me to be past belief. I think it is true, incidentally, that by and large, we've had for a long period of time uh, a tendency to run with unfavorable circumstances for manufacturing, which has discouraged the most able people from getting involved in it. And I think the quality of British management as a result of all this is pretty poor. Uh, but nevertheless, I think if there were real opportunities to make lots of money out of manufacturing, as happens everywhere else in the world, you'd find talent pouring into it. But there are three problems that really do need to be tackled, or these metrics have got to be in the right place if you're going to make a policy along the lines I've just described work. And this is what they are. The first is that you've got to have a pass-through rate on inflation which is manageable. Now, it's impossible to have a strategy with a lower exchange rate without imports becoming more expensive, and that has to be recognised. But there's also lots of other things that go the other way. When you have a lower exchange rate, by and large interest rates tend to be lower, taxation tends to be lower, production runs tend to be longer, and when you factor all these things in together, actually the impact of, of uh, devaluations on inflation is surprisingly small. And you've got a table there in the uh, pack there which shows what's actually happened with the various devaluations we've had since the World War II. And I think you may be surprised to see how relatively small the impact was. Even in 2002, 2007, 2009, when the pound went down by 25%, the inflation rate hardly flickered. And with the sort of devaluation I'm talking about here, it's probably around about 25%, roughly a par with the dollar, to make it worthwhile investing in plant in this country. Uh, the impact on inflation, I think, should be no more than about 1%. But at the moment, the bankers of this world are not worried about inflation being too high. They're worried about it being too low. And I think we'd have a more stable environment if inflation went back to uh, somewhere around about 3%, or price increases around about that sort of level. Uh, and uh, in, uh, the, the, this would be a, a more stable basis uh, for quenching the amount of uh, borrowing that's going on and rebalancing the economy to make it more stable. So the first thing is that uh, you've got to make sure that inflation doesn't get out of hand, uh, but I don't think it would do. The second is that you've got to get the elasticity of, of demand for imports and export in the right place. Now, at the moment, I think what has happened in the British economy is the uh, elasticity of demand for imports and export is actually quite low, particularly on exports. And I think the main reason for this is that the, m the main elasticity is related to uh, manufacturing industry. If we, what you've done is put all your manufacturing industry, or very large amounts of it, certainly the price sensitive bits of it out of business, you finish up with a, a levels of, of elasticity which are too low. But uh, if you have, uh, if you look at what happens when, when the pound goes down, the initial effect is for manufacturers to try and squeeze more <coughs> production 
out of the existing resources they've got. But what you really need to do to get the elasticity up is to make it worthwhile putting new plant down in the UK rather than somewhere else. And that's where the elasticity figures go up. And if you look at the historical record, which is the fourth table that you've got uh, on, the, on the sheets in front of you there, what you'll see is that the elasticities are quite high. There's a well-known economic phenomenon, which is called the Marger, Mar uh, Marshall, Marshall Lerner condition which is that the sum of the elasticities has to be more than one. And you'll see that uh, on these figures here, actually the elasticity historically on the UK has been quite high. It's been about three. And I think part of the reason for that it is that high was actually what elasticities measure is not only how much extra exporting and less importing you get when the exchange rate goes up, but it also measures the extent to which you deindustrialize the result of it being too high. And I think that may be some measure of how, how damaging too high an exchange rate is on the, on the level of competitiveness you want to achieve. And then finally, to make this all work, you need to get the return on investment up, at least for roughly half the investment you need to make to, to make sure that the numbers fit together. And this goes back to the problem, which is that most investment doesn't increase the growth rate significantly at all. It's only a relatively narrow forms of investment, again, let me repeat, mechanization, technology, and power that actually produce the growth rate. And unless you can shift the economy towards a point where, certainly at the margin, the extra investment goes in, is in those areas, you'll never get the economy to grow fast enough to deal with a real important constraint, which is that if you're going to drive living standards down to make the space available, rather they did in communist Russia, you will never carry people in a democracy. What you have to do is to get enough return out of the investment of the most productive kind earlier on to carry you through the process of getting the exchange rate higher. So what you need to do if you're going to compete on a level basis with the rest of the world is you need to get the percentage of GDP up from about 17% to 25% or so. That's the world average. You need about half of that to come from this very highly productive investment and half to come from all the other sorts of investment on road, rail, schools, which, which uh, are just as important from a social point of view, but don't produce the economic return to balance it all out. And if anybody's interested, I've got, done loads of work on how this would actually fit together in a macroeconomic framework. If you let me know, I'll send you the uh, graphs that show how it can be done and you can make it work. So anyway, to conclude, what I would say is two things to you. The first is that we badly need a change in priorities as far as the economy is concerned. Getting inflation down or keeping it down at 2% is not now the most important economic objective. It is much, much more important from a political point of view, from a social point of view, as well as an economic point of view, to get the growth rate up to some sort of reasonable level, which will allow most people in this country to enjoy increasing living standards and stop us falling further and further behind the rest of the world. The second thing I'd say to you is that uh, there's a concept which you're probably familiar with called the Overton window. And the Overton window describes what tends to happen when new ideas come along. Initially, the perception is that the new ideas are all impractical, not worth considering, not on the, anywhere near the economic consensus, and, and not really part of the agenda. The second stage in the Overton window is when they start getting debated to see whether they've got some merit and opinion begins to shift. The third stage is when they start being accepted and become just part of what everybody assumes must be right. And that's where most of the rest of the world is and that's where we're not. And my message to you to this evening is what you need to do is to look at these numbers that I've just told you in these arguments, and we need to shift that Overton window away from it, the idea about doing anything about a lower exchange rate being out of, out of the picture, away from the uh, consensus to being at least in the issue of debate. And that's what I recommended you do. And if I've achieved a little bit of that this evening,
I'll be very happy. Thank you.